Uh, as we've said before, and as you know, we have nearly 30,000 U.S. forces uh, stationed in South Korea alone that are focused on supporting and defending our, our ROK allies. Uh, so our commitment towards this end remains ironclad. But look, uh, North Korea and China, Russia have nuclear weapons, and then South Korea, Japan do not. Uh, there is a lot of public opinion that nuclear armament is necessary in order to be free from North Korean nuclear weapons. But why not? Why cannot have? Nuclear weapons. Uh, again, uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact from a, a regional security and stability standpoint and nonproliferation in terms of preventing uh, the potential chance for the uh, use of nuclear weapons. And so from a United States perspective, again, our policy remains very clear on denuclearization. But it's important also to remember that the Republic of Korea falls under that extended deterrence umbrella. And so uh, in addition to the U.S. forces uh, that are assigned there on the peninsula, uh, our allies in the region to include South Korea are, are part of that. What if uh, uh, the U.S. nuclear umbrella, nuclear umbrella doesn't work? Well, now we're getting into hypotheticals and, and speculating. And so I would say uh, that to date, it has worked, and it's worked very well. So let me go ahead and move on. In this Pentagon briefing, humans might find it interesting that the subject of nuclear weapons immediately precedes the question that follows. Randy. Thank you, sir. Um, on the 2022 UAP report, um, there's 366 reports since July 2022. The majority of those originate from U.S. Navy and Air Force aviators and operators who witnessed them during their operational duties and reported them to the previous task force and now ARO through official channels. What are those official channels that the Pentagon has um, set up for better information sharing on this topic? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. Uh, so first of all, let me just say right up top that um, the department wants to thank the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for leading the collaborative effort to produce this report, as well as all the other agencies that, that supported it. Uh, I would encourage you to, as I'm sure you are, uh, read that report uh, for any type of detailed information. Uh, broadly speaking, when it comes to the types of processes and procedures that have been established, uh, the, the Aero Office, as you highlighted, um, has closely worked with each of the service branches to come up with a streamlined reporting system to be able to, to collect that information. Uh, and then in addition to the military branches, is also working with the interagency. So uh, organizations like NOAA, the Coast Guard, Department of the Energy, just to name a few. Uh, and so by establishing those reporting procedures, what it does, and I think you'll see this in the report, is it allows the collection of data, and more data allows us to be a little bit more rigorous in terms of how we go after investigating these incidents. So hopefully that, that Yeah, helps. it does, and I appreciate the transparency here. Just a quick follow-up. Um, the report says that regarding health concerns, so far no encounters of UAP have been aligned with serious um, anomalous health incidents. Congress uh, pushed you guys and mandated ODNI and the Pentagon gone to look into that, which means there were reports from military aviators about anomalous health incidents. Is there anything you guys can share about what those health incidents ended up being if they were not UAP? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any information to provide. I'd encourage you to take a look at the report. I would say broadly speaking, uh, I think one of the key points in this report, you know, given, given the potential uh, hazard that UAPs do present. Notably, there's been no reported collisions of, of uh, military aircraft or U.S. aircraft, rather, uh, and UAPs. Um, but in terms of those specifics, I'd, I'd refer you back to the report. Uh, 